Can you tell me how did it feel in those moments pulling the trigger on some of those investments when there was so much noise and so much uncertainty? There's no doubt, given where the market level is, is consensus. Everyone's expecting this because markets have rebounded so hard, so everyone's expecting some normalisation of some layer. Now, it's quite peculiar to us that a lot of companies actually went and got more debt rather than delevering this. It's going to be interesting to see how it plays out because if we don't return to pre-corona levels, I suspect there'll be some interesting conversations with the banks. We've actually been investing in REITs in the last few weeks. They become so cheap. So what I learned was to have that plan before trouble sets in because it'll get you to make some decisions, which in a couple of years you look back on going, that was actually a decent decision that you made. So right now, uh, the market's rebounded pretty aggressively. Let's see, the market's factoring a normalization of some sort of uh, the economy returns. Um, and that provided there was a really small window of opportunity in March where there's a bit of information vacuum. Governments hadn't reacted yet. Central banks reacted, obviously, by providing liquidity, et cetera. Um, so there was a very small window of opportunity where pretty much a lot of the market went on sale. You know, big discounts, everything got thrown out. It was pretty much indiscriminate selling. So um, that window is so small until the governments reacted. So if you hadn't done some work there and had a go at a few new opportunities or doubled up on your favourites, et cetera, you missed a bit of it. So the market's sort of pricing that in today. Um, we did have quite a bit of indiscriminate selling across the board. So good companies are thrown out with bad companies. But there is going to be, out of this, some longer term structural issues were brought to a head, right? So we, it's, going to have to happen, it's going to happen quicker. So companies were forced to pull out their restructurings, to uh, set their business up for a, sort of maybe a new paradigm. They thought they might have five years to get to somewhere. They had to do it in three months and work on a plan for the next two years. Mm -hmm. So um, when it comes to our positioning, the way we looked at it was, okay, it's always determined by the va value, where we're seeing the valuation support, where we can make some money by buying things where the market's overly discounting the outcome. So we looked for some sectors or companies that had short-term problems, as in, you know, had a sudden stop in the economy, right? So consumption dropped pretty quickly in a lot of sectors. Uh, so we're looking at those sectors where the short-term headwinds, but the companies in those sectors were going to be the long-term winners. So they were still in a good sector, um, and that company had good management, decent balance sheet, but they also used the the market dislocation is an opportunity to press their advantage. Mm. So there's a bit of that setting up in the portfolio. But then also, as I mentioned before, the indiscriminate selling was quite broad in a lot of the cyclicals, as you'd expect. Um, and that set itself up where you could buy uh, things which had fallen 50% in the space of a couple of weeks. Um, and you didn't have to be very heroic about any sort of normalization for you to make a return on your investment on those. We'll come back and talk about some stock specifics in a little bit. Um, I just want to stay high level just for, for a, a period of time. How are you thinking about the recovery process for, for the economy, um, underlying economies, given that there's been the big stop um, and people are trying to figure out how much of the workforce comes back, um, which industries are most impacted. Um, just keen to hear how, what your views are on, on, on the parts of the economy that you think look okay, the ones that you're more cautious on where you think that the road forward is a bit more more difficult? So obviously anything travel related, it's going to take a bit of time and it's going to be very different within the sector itself in that um, I, th I suspect given that it's the COVID still running around in other countries that are just starting their that phase of it, mm. the global travel bans will probably be in for a bit longer than we expect. Um, and probably leisure will return, funnily enough, domestic leisure will probably return quicker than business travel. Yeah. Um, so there's that elements like that, that part of the city will slowly improve. Um, but parts of the disc discretionary sectors as well. So you've seen some of the winners, JB Hi-Fi, Harvey Norman, done well out of the work from home move. Uh, but <clears throat> some of the other discretionary retails will get a steady improvement as people get out on the streets, start to shop. Gaming, we think gambling will rebound pretty quickly. And I think the evidence as live sports come back is you've seen uh, betting pools rebound very quickly. Um, but there's no doubt um, that 
this, given where the market level is, is consensus. Everyone's expecting this because markets have rebounded so hard. So everyone's expecting some normalization of some layer. So try and, what the real question is today is not um, the recovery, you're gonna have an element of recovery, is that some sectors will take a lot longer to recover and that's where the work needs to be done. More importantly though, some sectors may never recover. So they may go back to 60 or 80% of pre-corona earnings or sales, et cetera. So um, that's where the work's to be done now because you've had the returns generated by a bounce in the market. You've got to try and work out you're in the right stocks that you're not overestimating the recovery in those sectors. So that's, that's where we think we are now. Is That's how we're trying to position ourselves. That's the underlying and the fundamentals. The other big part of the equation is what's happening with central bank stimulus um, and interest rates, which where we've had, we thought they couldn't go lower. They found a, a new low here domestically and there's all sorts of stimulus being pumped into the economy from, from offshore. How does that, as a value focused manager, um, knowing what was happening in terms of momentum and growth um, in the market pre the COVID crisis, does that, st that trend start to emerge again? Does that factor into your thinking? Yeah, so uh, that's why it was really important at the early phase of this to make some, um, be aggressive when the opportunities presented themselves in March, especially in March is because we, you know, at the back of your mind as a value investor, you know that the central bank's sitting there providing stimulus and people are using um, any valuation methodology to justify anything, and you can, so to speak. Uh, it doesn't mean it's the right investment, but that's, that's what was going on. So as a value investor, pulling the trigger when the opportunities are in front of, when you thought things were trading at a 50% discount, um, you, had to, you had to act pretty quickly. So we, we're of the view that we've done enough in that we've bought the right things at the right time, that it should outweigh those elements, um, and that there are gonna be some winners. There are gonna be some structural winners out of this and some structural losers. And as a value investor, for us, more importantly, is to try and avoid the structural losers because you get attracted to valuation, and then occasionally you buy things where the earnings go backwards for the next 10 years, but the multiple's the same. And that's usually, the, um, for a value investor, you gotta try and avoid that sort of uh, investment case because it can be quite devastating to your portfolio. But we're of the view that we've sort of positioned our portfolio in, in two distinct camps, those long-term winners that provide a real short-term opportunity to get set and some of the deep cyclicals where you're going to get a recovery and the market was overestimating how bad it was going to be. Can you go into some more detail on, on those two, um, few examples of some of the stocks that you own in those two camps that you've outlined yep. there? So, uh, Obviously, with the Petro Equity Investment Company, we can buy some offshore stocks. So we bought, we doubled down on our Flutter investment. It's been a good investment, but um, I remember in March, it had fallen 40 odd percent. Um, obviously, there's no live sport, <clears throat> given it's an online sports betting company, 80% of it's effectively online sports betting. Um, obviously, there's gonna be a revenue hit, uh, but we know the quality of the business. We know that gambling returns pretty quickly when there's um, you remember this wasn't an income shock for the man on the street, given the level of transfer payments from government directly to the man on the street, mm. there wasn't really an income shock at this level. So we know that gambling will pick up pretty quickly, but you'll be able to buy, we'll be able to buy Flutter at half of what we could do in February. So we went pretty hard and we doubled our exposure to that one. Crown, another, you know, it's been a core cool holding for us for a while, but it had fallen to a level down to about $6, $6.50, where you're getting the assets for, for basically a big discount. And these are monopolistic city-based assets run for a long time and you're not gonna get another one typically built in the same city. And there'd been takeover interests in the past 12 months? Yeah, so there'd been, yeah, there'd been a couple of interested parties. Um, and obviously, <clears throat> again, we doubled down on, on Crown as well. And you, know, you had Blackstone show up and take over the Melco stake of 9.9%. And if you look at Blackstone's history, they've done some transactions in North America on casino properties where they take lift the assets out and the management of the existing entity manages the assets for them. So we always thought that there was value in the assets and at that such a discount to value of those underlying assets, we thought there was a real opportunity for us there. Uh, but then you have a look at, <clears throat> on the cyclical side, you had, um, Industrial metals, Oz Minerals, those sort of businesses, oh, Luca, they fell to such levels 
that the replacement value, the assets, again, were not called, called into question, but the market was assuming pretty bad outcomes. So on, the, on that cyclical bucket that you're able to buy discounts, do they remain long-term positioning for the, uh, within the portfolios or is that, was that opportunistic style investing? There is an element of opportunistic there, but some of the, like the Oz Minerals is a good business in general, it's hard to get copper exposure, um, particularly where they're growing their, their, um, their reserves, et cetera. And they've done gone through Carapatina, they've gone ex, in the middle of the CapEx, nearly finished it, et cetera. Oil especially is another one where we, had a, we put some money to work. Um, you know, negative oil prices, I suspect, uh, was quite stunning to most people. Whether it was real, I don't, I don't know. But it did provide, again, that, that noise provided an opportunity to buy some very uh, cheap oil exposure. Uh, and you know, energy's been on the nose for quite a while. So uh, we still think there's some value to be had in a lot of those names. Yeah. I was listening to a, a webinar recently, and you, and you described corporate debt as the elephant in the room right now. Could I just get you to explain in a bit more detail what you mean by that and why it's something that needs to be, to be thought about? So, uh, you know, the four quality filters we look at all companies through a, a decent balance sheet, lowly geared balance sheet is preferred and demanded by us. Uh, just because it does tend to keep you out of trouble when things like what Corona, what we just went through occurs. Um, it is interesting the pre, you know, up into February, Mark was at record highs. Um, companies were doing buybacks, borrowing money to do the buyback, leveraging up. Um, and then once it hit, uh, companies cancelled dividends, stopped buybacks. It was a cash flow hit, right? So we had complete cessation of all cash flow in some, some businesses. Um, so then debt became a problem because you had to make your interest payments. So you're leaning on your banks to extend terms, etc. So it says, suggests to us a lot of companies that weren't preparing for a rainy day. Um, now, it's quite peculiar to us that a lot of companies actually went and ex got more debt rather than delevering this. You know, infrastructure, which is quite a defensive sector, but this, the corona was very specific to that sector in that travel had stopped and they were working from home, less movement, movement etc. So uh, a lot of those companies, rather than delever, like Auckland International Airport, delevered. They did a raising. A lot of the Australian ones did not and they've extended terms and put a bit more debt on. Now, the risk here is, is when you put more financial leverage in those assets, uh, they were all high, highly financially levered anyway, because it's a, usually a stable business. What happens if, you, you just ask the question, what happens if we don't return to normal levels for five years? All of a sudden you've got more debt to service with less earnings compared to the last cycle. So all it does is introduce another business risk um, and people tend not to consider it when rates are low. So um, what you're saying is, the response, this opportunity was to be more conservative. There's been low interest rates and, and the appeal has, has, has lent companies to go and get more debt and it's just incre it's amplified the risk that was already within them. Yeah, so they've thought, okay, this is a short term event, so we'll add, we need access to liquidity because cash flows uh, dissolved effectively. So we need just access to liquidity, pay the bills, etc. cetera. Um, for us, that was, it's gonna be interesting to see how it plays out because if we don't return to pre-corona levels, it's, I suspect there'll be some interesting conversations with the banks. Vince, I, when I look back at the cash holdings that you had in the portfolio for PIC, um, pre and post crisis, you pushed up towards 16% in February. Keen to understand what dictates the cash level to come back down, obviously you've seen some opportunities, you put it to work around 3% last time I looked. What caused it to get up to 16% and, and how do you think about managing that cash? So cash is sort of like a bit of an outcome for us. Look, we assess everything on both an absolute basis and a relative value basis. So when we're seeing better opportunities in the fund on an absolute basis, we'll deploy the cash pretty aggressively um, and you wait for those moments. But you know, in February, market was pretty heated. Um, and we were really struggling to deploy the cash. You're having to make choices where it was, something was less worse than something else. So I'd rather not make those. And in the peak, you can get, we can go up to 25% cash. So, but also what we did is in January, the cost of protection was quite cheap because volatility was so low. So we'd bought some deep out of the money puts on the market. Um, very cheap for us. 
and that extended, you know, for a certain percentage of the portfolio, gave us a little bit more cushion. So when March hit, it gave a real cushion to the portfolio. So it's typically uh, opportunity led when we think about managing our cash levels. Um, and you know, we've got a big team internally, so we're constantly, we've got 17 people in the team, we're constantly scouring for new opportunities, whether it's domestically or, or internationally. And then you had the event, so you know, there was value on, I said everything was on sale, a lot of the market was on sale. So as you said, we went down to about 3% cash. That's how it drifted back out of it as we've started to take some money off the table and prepare maybe for some other opportunities down the road. Wouldn't mind talking about uh, a couple of uh, specific areas in the Australian market. Um, some where you've had, had exposure, some where you've had none. Mm -hmm. um, Flight Centre, um, a company that was under extreme stress yep. um, and still hasn't fully rebounded. You participated in the recapitalisation of, of that business. Talk me through the th thesis on a business like Flight Centre that's in an industry that looks like it's going to be so heavily impacted by, mm. by travel restrictions. So Flight Centre has always been within our quality universe. It's always the four good management, good business, good balance sheet and uh, profitable business. So it's always been in our universe, but we've had some issues with some of the structural headwinds that potentially could occur. Um, in particular, it's, it is, can be a quite cyclical business. Um, and when you're running a negative working capital business, when the top line falls, it can be, you can run out of cash really quickly. Um, but it's a well-managed business. But they had to make, we could see they were making some choices to restructure the business. So what the corona crisis did for them was it allowed them, and they acted, you could tell they had a plan ready to go. Because within the space of a, few, few, a week or two, they had announced a re, an accelerated restructuring program, which when we looked through, it was like, it's the, that's exactly what they should be doing, spot on. Um, and they acted pretty quickly, and then they said, right, let's buffer the balance sheet as well, let's build up some, an ability to make these structural shifts. So when we go through it, they're now really well positioned, I think, for the medium to long term, that they've set the business up to actually survive what we're going through now and probably be stronger on the other side as they're restructured in the right areas. So you take advantage of those opportunities when they arise. We've been looking at it for a while and when the placement came about, it was a great opportunity for us to enter into the, the business because we'd already done the work. And we, knew, we sort of, we knew what they needed to do. Um, but obviously having a management team that's been through it before, they've been through a few cycles. So it does help that they realise when, the, when there's a problem that they act pretty quickly. Mm. That stock hasn't rebounded in the same V shape that the, the broader market has. Do you feel like there's unrecognised value there still? If you're entering in at the placement price, it's rebounded quite well because it's obviously doubled. So um, that's our first position in the stock. So we think there's still value to be had. But it, from here, it's going to take execution on the, the restructure and some tailwinds from a recovery in travel, global travel. So it's, again, it's what I talked about a medium to longer term, but there is value to be had in, the, in, the, in flight centre still. Yeah. So let's talk about exclusions, A rates um, and, 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 and property. Um, what's your view on, on that sector? I mean, there's, um, I, I think you didn't have an exposure to it pre-COVID, but things get so cheap. Is, is there a price that everything gets on the table and, and is worthy of a consideration? Talk me through the thesis on rates. Given low rates, as you said before, it is one of the sectors where, and the thirst for yield, everyone was, um, had an allocation or parked money in rates. We struggle with premium stand TA on those things when rates are very low, because it doesn't give you a lot of room to manoeuvre if something goes wrong. Um, if disc discount rates go up, etc. cetera. Um, and the economy is pretty buoyant, so everyone was assuming low vacancy rates forever. Some of the, in some of the REITs and we sort of struggle with that because there is cycles. Um, uh, but actually, we've actually been investing in REITs in the last few weeks. So they become so cheap in that, look, there's going to be, there's definitely going to be a renegotiation and a resetting of, at some level in retail and maybe in office, I'm not too sure. But that's, an, that's a conversation that's being had. But the way the market was pricing some of the equity was that it was going to be devastating, like 30% drops of NTA um, and rental will fall by half, etc. It was pretty extreme. So the market was sort of giving you an opportunity to buy into the REITs. On a multi-year basis, I'm quite happy that some of the prices we've paid for some of the, the REITs we've been buying because I think we're going to make money, good decent return on investment over the next couple of years. So 
as you said, never say never. Um, the opportunity arose because of the extreme moves. And it was, when you think of the sectors that performed the worst, it was energy, financials, uh, some discretionary, industrial cyclicals, and REITs. And typically REITs would perform quite well in a sort of market meltdown. Mm. But it was such a specific event, uh, the market turned pretty quickly. So yeah, you use those opportunities to add value when you can. The subsectors within the um, the REITs, you know, you've got your office, you've got your retail. Have you been selective about the the exposures that you want um, within the within the REIT universe? We've been buying some a bit of office. Our exposure is some office, and we've been buying a, a company which sits across a few sectors, uh, not massive over others, but it has a developer in it as well. So we sort of suspect that housing is going to be one of the things the government's going to try and maintain. Um, some sort of stimulus and obviously with immigration being really low, potentially for the next 18 months, two years, uh, you're thinking about the second order impacts on housing and development, but we th think that um, the owner-occupied market will probably dominate most of that market in the next few years. Uh, and you can see the programs the government's sort of bringing about from direct transfer payments to individuals to being a bit more targeted to sectors to sort of stimulate that growth. So. Um, yeah, we've been very specific. We're not really in retail exposure at the moment. Um, our preference is for office and something that's a bit more broader than that. Mm. Um, look at the recent performance in PIC. It's been a good period. Um, obviously, you don't, you, you don't want to bank on the past returns, but it, it has, you know, last few months have been particularly, particularly strong. Aside from things that have worked, can you talk me through things that haven't gone so well? And um, feel those. Yeah. yeah, well, just talk, talk through some of the things that, that, you know, maybe in the context of some lessons, like what are some of the things that, that haven't worked out so well that you've learned along the way? So if I think about one of the offshore stocks which didn't work, so Lloyd's Bank in the UK, you know, big retail bank, multiple brands in asset management as well as insurance. Um, and the thesis there was um, trade very, looked very cheap to us. And given the conditions, we could see a change in the conditions of the underlying economy. So you had years of austerity in the UK and you had a, a Brexit where there was complete uncertainty. And then in the space of um, you know, six months to 12 months, um, you had a, a majority conservative government get voted in whose mandate was to grow the, like, grow the economy and spend some money, go very anti-austerity. Um, and Brexit was effectively cleared up. They're gonna, the deal's going to get done at some point and there'll be a bit more clarity on the other side. So, you know, the, you could see that the UK economy could really, really re-accelerate its growth uh, from just removing one of the handbrakes, which was austerity. So Lloyd's is like right in the centre of that. It's a retail bank. Um, and you can see how they managed through the period of very, really soft trading for quite well as a bank. Uh, and we're sort of through most of the regulatory issues regarding mis-selling, etc. Um, but when a crisis hits, far enough, and this is you'll know you'll find this in all banks and financials, is correlations of global financials go to one. It didn't matter whether if you owned a bank in the UK, the US, Australia, or Europe, they all traded exactly the same. So your investment thesis, the original investment thesis, went out the window pretty quickly. So that's one that hasn't really worked. Another one which hasn't worked for us has been event hospitality. Again, a hotel, cinema operator in Australia, um, complete travel lockdown, no one's moving around, no, one's rent, no business travel as well. So it can be quite extreme. That's an extreme hit for a business like that. But, um, you know, it's a high quality business, great assets, uh, all on balance, a fair chunk of them is on, bal on balance sheet. Really good management team, very good management team and a good, ba and a good balance sheet to sustain some subpar trading for a while. You know, that's one of the stocks we really we added to in the sell down because it fell quite a lot, fell almost 40, 50%. So um, that's a really high quality business. It didn't work, but I'm pretty confident about the long term for that business. I think we get cinemas opening in July, so maybe a, posi a positive tailwind. Yep. Um, outside of the individual um, uh, you know, stock stories you've talked through there, you know, each crisis is, is a little different. You've probably invested through a few in your career. What are a couple of lessons that you've picked up from, from investing through the past few months? Um, I know nothing about epidemiology. <laughs> uh, but that's all right, because everyone became an overnight expert, basically. So it didn't really matter whether you knew about that at all. 
because um, the second thing I learned was is to have a plan when things go wrong, right? And that, that re revolves around your investment process. Have an understanding of how you're going to react, what companies you're looking at, that when they get to your, your valuation levels where there's enough of a discount, and we, you know, our team went through every company and worked out, right, worst case scenario, what's the valuation, take 20% off that, if there's enough margin of safety, we should be buying these names. Because at the time, there was a lot of noise, but no real information. So you had to rely on your investment process to sort of get you through. And as I mentioned before, you know, pulling the trigger is the hardest thing to do, particularly in that, that environment. And we're, you know, we're all decentralized as well. So information flow may not have been as, as well, good, but we worked through it. Um, so what I learned was to have that plan before um, trouble sets in because it'll get you through. It'll actually make you, it'll get you to make some decisions, which in a couple of years you look back on going, that was actually a decent decision that we made. Can you tell me how did it feel in those moments pulling the trigger on some of those investments when there was so much noise and so much uncertainty? Can you recall the, the guts? Yeah, um, it was an interesting period because you're going, <laughs> if this goes longer than I think, this could be a career ender. Um, but, uh, but we've got a pretty robust process. Uh, and I said, you've got 17 investing professionals to rely on. So you defer to the team. Um, you're trying to do a few things at the same time and everyone was working in the same direction. So uh, it was actually became a lot easier. You freed your mind a bit when you, had, you know you had a team looking at all the angles on particular stocks. So it allowed us to be a bit freer in our decision making. And we, um, again, you pulled the trigger. Um, but it was difficult. I can remember in the third or fourth week of March, it was, you had to make some choices. Great. Well, thanks for your time. Thank you.